Well, I pulled a newspaper from a garbage can. It was from five weeks ago. And I gave it to Mike and Greg to read to ya on a Sunday paper show. Wait, let's do that. Greg Fitzsimmons clap. Greg Fitzsimmons clap. There it is. Here goes my clap. Three, two, one. Yes. Okay, and we sir. are recording. I think you can start screaming before I put. Read my all headphones. about it. Read all about it. It's a wake-up call for the country and for me. I'm fucking exhausted, Mike Gibbons. I'm. There's no way to start a podcast. We talked a little bit about it before the podcast started when yes. the Zoom began, and you, uh, you had some. Disruptions in your sleep last night. Noise was waking you up. Yeah, the I, wife was a little snorry last night. And I wasn't going to say that. Over, you told so. me not to say that. Well, whatever. It's out there now. It's out there. My wife snores. So she needs help. She needs. Uh, she needs to see a specialist in L.A. I think. That's my cut, diagnosis. You also so apparently like one of the most popular things now is is building homes with two primary bedrooms. Really? Do you, do you know why I said primary? Why? Because Master has been faded out. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. It is no longer the Master's bedroom. I think that's a and dumb... And this is the Master bedroom, and down the hall here we have the slave cabins. It can still be called your Masturbatorium, but yes. it's no longer the Master bedroom. But getting back to that, you know, it began with separate... Uh, bathrooms, you know, were like separate, really like the two yeah. sinks, two sinks. And then the bathrooms kept moving further apart a little. Um, and uh, but I remember going to Ben Stein's house in Beverly Hills and he's married and we were shooting That's something. Great name there. drop for 2001. Well, I I was going to say I can't name the name, but it turns out I can definitely name that name because no one's going to be offended and people it's almost like making up a name. But anyway, they had two master bedrooms and I thought it was like, uh oh, trouble in paradise. I think it was the opposite. I think they had less trouble in paradise because of the two master bedrooms. I would enjoy a literally if it was a giant walk in closet, put a bed in there, just a full size bed. Some soundproofing, I'm good. I would gladly snuggle with my wife, read in bed, and then say, okay, baby, I'll see you in eight hours, and then I would go walk into my walk-in closet and sleep. All right, this is how diseased you are. You just described another master bedroom, but it has no windows, and it has <laughs> clothes and shoes in it. Yes. And that's good enough for you. <laughs> Hey, you're doing, a, you're doing a podcast from one, so I don't know what you're talking about. Why could yeah, the sound is so muffled <laughs> that it's professional almost. So wait, why wouldn't you just cuddle, do whatever in bed, and then walk down the hall to your bedroom? Because I like that you're <laughs> saying that this is still our bedroom. This is still our place of communion in our marriage. But I just kind of sneak off for the sleeping part and then i come back again in the morning and you, you know, so you you maybe have some marital relations with your wife and then you slowly under darkness slip back into the closet <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm how this that. looks with you sitting there like that right i'm getting that right yes yeah. i am fully look at me i'm in the closet um we just well, had a lovely uh, anniversary. We went off to Lake Arrowhead and uh, we stayed. Our friend Annie and John, friends, they have a house up there on, and it's on the lake. Oh. It's so beautiful. It's a two, two story cabin with a view of the lake. You walk down a little path to get to their dock. You sit out on the dock all day. You read books. You swim in the lake. The water temperature is beautiful. Um, took hikes every day. Um, took some mushrooms. It was just a groovy time. It was amazing. <laughs> I was so envious till you hit the word groovy. Yeah. Uh, but no, they, of course, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Um, John Doerr, who is a great stand-up comedian, 
Oh, my God. Google his stuff on Conan. But uh, I worked with him at one point. Canadian. Anyway, Canadian, the nicest guy. He started commute before the pandemic. He started commuting from up there. No kidding. And, you know, listen, he didn't have a nine to five job. So it would be like he'd come in to do sets. And that probably wasn't every night because, you know, it's a healthy drive. But I well, mean, the problem with the drive is once you get to San Bernardino, you go straight up a mountain and it's it's uh, what do you call it? Back roads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you go uh, back and forth. Yep. Uh, switchbacks, switchback and, uh, roads yeah. all the way up. It's pretty. It's a gnarly drive. You get a little car sick, but it's so worth it because the lake. You can't get on the lake unless you live on it. So it's not a jackass festival where people just pull up in motorboats and scream and yell. Um, so uh, it's peaceful, and um, yeah, it was great. It was great. I would. I, I just wish it was longer. We went for three days. I could have spent. I could have spent five or six. No, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, very good getaway, and, uh, and um, happy anniversary. Thank you. 23 years, and wow. uh, yeah, other than the snoring, everything's perfect. I mean, isn't the, it's also because we're, uh, we're older, but isn't the idea of two master bedrooms, I don't know, that sounds amazing to me. Um, I have my own now, so uh, I think part of it is, uh, you know, letting go of that. You're the opposite. You haven't had that in 23 years. Yeah. Your own bedroom, you have it on the road. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. Uh, when During the pandemic, I felt very guilty that I would drive past the airport and I would get uh, a little bit of FOMO. I would. I, I missed hotels. I missed sleeping late, being able to watch sports sitting on the bed, eating fucking barbecue that I got from a takeout place. Um, I, having having sex anytime you want. Anytime I want with it, <laughs> with whatever chambermaid is cleaning the room. Oh, I meant by yourself. Come on, uh, I wasn't going there. Um, yeah, I missed it, and I, I do love it. I love being on the road. I'm looking forward to... It's weird, though, because I get depressed that I'm leaving because I do like home. I, my kids are home. So I'll be sad that I'm gone. I'm leaving for nine days tomorrow morning. and uh, But I also am looking forward to the hotel life. Yeah, no doubt. Well, listen, so we're, may, maybe a listener can write in. So I deal with snoring a little bit, too. I I I have to sleep on my side. But there's all this advice, like you do the like Flonase. You maybe even wash out. If congestion is a big part of it, I think that is for me. And it's why I'm breathing through my mouth when I sleep. But anyway, maybe a listener who knows a lot about this can, uh, or some listeners who have a hack that works can write in. Because it's a yeah. huge issue. Yes. It's a very big issue, actually. We'd appreciate that. Uh, her email address is... There we go. Right to her. Right to her. So you can see her tonight. We're going to see you tonight at uh, your sister's party. Yeah, the British cousins, these two really funny girls, college age, are coming in. We saw them in New York at the St. Patrick's Day Parade. They flew in with their family, and their dads are, you know, my generation. And, you know, we would tell stories when they first came over, and they would repeat stories to me. And I'm like, I have no memory of that. But, you know, we would just go crazy in New York when we were uh, in our late teens and another visit in the 20s. And now they have girls just like I do. And so this next generation, you know, that's the one we went out in New York with Olivia. Olivia borrowed the British ID that time. Yeah, yeah. And they worked on her accent. So I told Laura we should get, uh, just as a joke, we should get tater tots uh, for something to eat tonight. Because that was the word the British cousin used to make fun of how Americans, like tater tots. Like she would just <laughs> use that to mock what an American accent sounded uh -huh. like. Yeah. And so uh, every time Olivia was practicing, like, uh, I'm from England, you know, and I yeah. can't do it. But they'd be like, tater tot, like, you know, like <laughs> meaning you're not even close. <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time talking to them tonight because uh, I'm currently reading a book um, about the Irish famine. It's called The Famine Plot, and it's about how the British systematically plotted to make the famine bad as a way of controlling the Irish population. And they say, 
you know, the British will tell you a million people died during the the, the famine. They say it's actually closer to like 1.9 million, not to mention the 2 million that emigrate. Was it one or two million? I think it was two million people emigrated. Immigrated. Um, wow. Wait, well, emigrate here, means you left. They emigrated. Yes. Yeah. All right, here's the good news. They are Irish. Oh. Well, great. they're they're not, but yeah. their family, no one was in England at the time of that. Okay, fair enough. Uh they're the generation right before us had a skedaddle. Yeah, I think no, no. So my grandfather left, but I think they actually stayed in Ireland. They're even more Irish uh than I am. I think it was their parents who went to England. Yeah. Yeah. So uh it's their first generation English, I think. That's a shorter way of saying it. You'll find out tonight. Boy, I hope that goes well. Because we're gonna be, be party. playing drinking D- games. Is, is Gubbins playing? Is he showing up? Yeah, I believe so. He's the party favor that uh that's the good news for Gubbins segment. He's gonna be at the party yeah. tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Laura needs him at every point. Okay, he is. He is the absolute best social ingredient to put in any recipe. Yeah, he uh, he'll dance. Reason. He'll he'll make fun of people in a playful way. He's great um, with names. He'll call them out. He's keeping track yeah. of who's drinking what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he as polices long as the, the party in a way. As long as the games don't get too serious for him, then we're good. Exactly. Well, this is called Rage Cage, and it's going to blow your mind. And I think you might get sick first drinking all your uh, pussy beer. What's Rage Cage? Uh, it's a combination of beer pong and chase quarters. Uh huh. It's drinking is actually the least, obviously, especially at, I mean, even once you're past 22 years old. In fact, drinking, it's so much, the, the idea is not to drink. You know what I mean? Like, so, uh, it's just this game of skill and you don't want to get caught with these things. It doesn't even matter. Oh my God. They would fill it with like white. Oh, cause of Sophie, maybe they fill them with white claw cause she's celiac. Jesus. That's the worst shit on earth. Yeah. Truly, truly awful. Are yeah. they a sponsor? I didn't look. Uh, what's this mask in airport? What does that mean? So last week, you know, I was in Kentucky. So, I forgot to tell you this. So I'm in the airport. Kentucky or, or Tennessee? I mean, uh, I mean uh, Tennessee. Sorry. I always confuse it because Hoffman's actually born in Kentucky, but he lives in Tennessee now. So anyway, uh, and boy, lucky I didn't go to Kentucky. It was underwater. Um, anyway, in while traveling, in the airport in Tennessee, um, I was like, had my mask on. One of the only people in the whole airport to have a mask on. And I was like online at something, and a guy turns around and goes to me, um, "You're still worried about that stuff, huh?" Oh. And uh, and I pull down. <laughs> no, he goes, "You're still worried about that, or whatever." So I pull down my mask, like nice, friendly. Pull down my mask and a big smile. I'm like, "I'm not so worried. I'm on day six. <laughs> no, you did it. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that guy. That's awesome. <laughs> because as I was getting all these like looks, I was like, how do you know I'm not protecting you? Right. How do you know I'm not Asian? Right. You can't tell. <laughs> what do you think? All Asian people have the same eyes? No. So everyone, please steal my move if you want to really alarm people who are maybe giving you a stare. Like, oh, don't worry about this. Or don't or like they're looking. Oh, don't worry. I'm, I, I'm on day six. I don't even think I need this, really. I'll tell yeah. you, I am wearing the mask when I fly the, tomorrow. I am I am wearing the mask on all flights of on this course. trip. Of course. Yeah. No, it's happening everywhere. I had like two Zooms earlier today. Both Zooms had uh, COVID stories. One, you know, like a, a non-participant couldn't make it. And I'm trying to think of others. But I think Sophie had it. So I picked Sophie up at the airport last night. She came back from Europe. Her stories were so funny. Did she also, have COVID? We believe so. I picked her up with a test, but I also felt a little confident because she said she'd been feeling like shit for five days. 
I think she did. I mean, it could have been a cold. She partied all over for three weeks, uh, Europe, staying in hostels and the whole like cheap way to do Europe. And she, um, but, but one part of her sickness was she lost her sense of smell. Really? Which I didn't even know was in this strain. Wow. But I've lost. Maybe she got I've the also old strain. The old strain's still around. And but she already had that. But it was a, a while ago. They had it way before me. So anyway, it's going around everywhere. But uh, I pick her up anyway. She tells me about in Greece. It was mostly in. She was in Corfu, mostly British and Irish. And she just said they're they're just so funny. And oh my God, do they like beer, right? You know. So it's so f- great, like watching this new generation learn yeah. kind of national characteristics and stuff like that. But uh, the one guy, this one guy, was the most amusing. And what did he say? He's like, uh, "Not I'm square." V- listeners are probably knowing what I'm trying to get to. Like, uh, I'm situated. Like he'd be like, uh, ha- ha- "Had six pints. I'm 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 fit. I'm situated. I'm God. I'm forgetting what it is." But it's a phrase they use, uh, yeah. and uh, I'll, I'll remember it in a little bit. But he, they, she said they, they were the most fun. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I um, know. So, so she had a good. Well, I'll, I'll ask her tonight. I'm sure she's so sick of being asked how it was, but she just got back, so I'll be one of the first people to ask her how it was. Yeah, no, she had a great time. Was kind of sick in Paris, but I'm like, you know, that's kind of the one to miss compared to Italy, and. Yeah. And partying in Greece. She loved Sicily, which I've never been to. Yeah, me neither. And apparently that's, and it's, uh, she sent me pictures of the water there. Oh my God. So yeah. Sicily's high on the list. But Paris, like, you'll be, if you go to Europe, that's probably the place you're, you know what I mean? You're going to do Paris again. Yeah. And fuck them. Fuck them. They only saved us during the Revolutionary War. Yeah, well, we more than paid them back, I, I think we can say. Yeah, I think so. But, um, yeah, they're disdained for tourists. And she really, they talked about that. She's like, no one's smiling and no one, you know, but that's a New York thing, too. All righty. You know who we can't thank back oh. enough is uh, Marcos Calandrelli, who did the Sunday Papers logo this week. That's a abstract. really nice logo. Yeah, it's thought. Yeah. I like that. It's very cool. It's thoughtful. And the song from Wade Daniels, who you heard you heard it at the beginning of the show. I think uh, hard to describe, really. Well, Wade, it's hard for me to describe. I haven't heard it yet, but no. because we have a thing where I can. But I'm looking forward to it, and that you sent one in is uh, great. Uh, some corrections. Mike Mulroy hmm. says your battery-powered luggage is called Away, not Up. Up is a movie about an old man floating away on a balloon who probably can't remember Robert Duvall's name either. <laughs> Got us. Uh, Eric from Duluth says, Hey, Greg, let's straighten this out for the last time. The guy Mike talks about every week is Charles Adams. He's an old-school cartoonist who worked for the Armed Forces in WW2 and created the Adams Family. Two the Ds. Far, the Far Side is from the 80s and 90s and was created by Gary Larson. Scott Adams is a right-wing nut job who has drawn the Dilbert comic for going on 30 years uh, now, that used to be about crazy office life, but is now a thinly veiled commentary on his idea of wokeism. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a long one from... Uh, do we need this one? No. Nah. Which one? What's it on? Well, about transsexualism. I just... Uh, she's basically this woman, Deborah Cummings. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate the note. No, not Deborah Cummings. This is from somebody else. Says uh, formerly Deborah Cummings. She says transsexual is an outdated term. You should just say trans. Well, all right. Still, okay, that's maybe, but transsexual isn't wrong, right? Um, it's outdated. All right. Whatever. Deborah Cummings said, oops, Greg said Jimmy Hoffa's father was born in Brazil, India. He was born in Brazil, Indiana. So I wrote her back because I specifically remember reading it, and it was Indiana. So I said, you're insane. I said, (laughs) Indiana, your speakers are shorting out. So she wrote back to me, hey, Greg, I can't believe you made me go back and listen again. At 1.30.08, you did say he was born in Brazil, India. 
And now I'm going to play that clip for you right now. Now, this I is... can't hear it, but are you be honest. You be honest. I'm betting, I'm betting on Debbie. A poor coal miner in Brazil, India. Yep. I just said it. I just said India. Uh, if you so uh, she said, if you had seen my pronouns uh, are he, she, she, her, I'm sure you would have been more considerate. Love you guys. Oh, this is oh no, this is Debbie C. Okay. So Boy, we're I gonna get back, corrections I for our apologizing corrections. Apologizing that. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm gonna have a. I don't know who said what, but uh, so anyway, sorry, Debbie C. You're right. I said India. Dates coming up. Oh, I'm not gonna get these wrong. <laughs> I'll be in Vancouver and Ottawa this week. Oh, wait a minute. What's today? Sunday? I'll just be in Ottawa later this week with uh, Louis C.K. doing some shows. Then I'll be at Jonathan's in Agunquit, Maine, August 11th. Manchester, New Hampshire, August 12th and 13th. Lowell, Arkansas, September 16th and 17th. Then I'll be in New Orleans, Lafayette, Chicago, San Francisco, Tampa, Plano. Go to FitzDog.com for exact dates. Look at you, tickets, man. Right? That's taking you to December. Yeah, but I got to fill out some more dates. We're just we're just start. We got a bunch that we're working on. The, people are trying to give me money, but not enough. Ah. And then we'll fill those in as we get the numbers up. Because it can't just them. be about you know the love of the sport. No. Hey, Mike, do you have a VPN on your computer? You bet I do. It is. The greatest thing to happen to my computer since the little thing that you slide across the top and they can't see you while you're masturbating to porn. Um, <laughs> in 2022, if you don't have it on your kids' devices, you're completely insane. And I'm talking about the VPN. Uh, it's like walking your kids home from school and not telling them to watch out for windowless vans. Um, the the ExpressVPN, look, your, your, every computer has an IP address, which is like, your thumbprint and it's very easy to hack if you've you've made mistakes on lines online you've clicked on some sketchy links or exp or you had a some kind of bug has gotten in and uh and you have to you have to stop that from happening it's very simple you pay a small amount of money every month and these fine people at express vpn hide your real ip address and replace it with a dummy one so you download it, you tap one thing, it turns it on. It can be your phone, it's your, it's your iPad, it's your uh, computer. It, it covers everything with one membership. So easy to use. I'm 56, and I figured it out. Here's the coolest part. You can also use it to get into streaming services based in other countries. In other words, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, whatever, they offer different shows in different countries, and you can't access those unless you have ExpressVPN, and then you can pretend that you are in another country. Uh, like, say, you say you're in Germany. Then you put on a funny little hat, and you get a beer stein, and then you never know. And then you can see, like, I just watched uh, Netflix in the U.K., and they have all the Bourne movies, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. They've got a bunch of stuff. Uh, that you can only get there. So you make your money back right there. Secure your family's online activity and unlock tons of new shows by visiting expressvpn.com slash papers. Use my link and you can get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash papers, expressvpn.com slash papers to learn more. Mike, let's do the front page. I think it's time. I think it's time. Extra! Extra! Read all about it! Extra! All right. Here's the update um, from last week. This is news. So we're recording this on a Thursday because you're heading out of the country. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Talk. Oh, okay. I'm going to talk. So you're heading out of the country. We're doing this on Thursday. And so uh, the update just came in and it's Brittany Griner, the WNBA pothead was just found guilty <laughs> of drug possession and smuggling in Ru in a Russian court outside of Moscow. She has been sentenced to nine years in prison. Good news is the work program in the Russian prison pays 30% more than her <laughs> WNBA contract. 
Yeah. And that's rubles. And that's in rubles. Yeah. Um, well, look, we all knew that her being found innocent in this trial was a long shot. And I think we all know how long shots go in the WNBA. Little Listen, short. Little, little <laughs> short. It did not did not work. Um so here's my question from last week, and I know a lot of people are spilling ink on this, but let's say we did do this deal, right? Because because also the nine years is kind of people are like, you know, but slow down because there's maybe a uh an exchange of uh, prisoners that's going on uh, at a higher levels with the governments. So let's say we do trade this arms dealer who's in prison here back to Russia, Russian arms dealer, and we get her. Does she go to jail? Here? No. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Well, a lot of people are upset because if she had been caught with that in the wrong states a decade ago— or, or any state a decade ago, she would be sent to jail. You know, I, I don't know if she'd go to jail, but would you go to jail for? Did, well, was listen. there any point where you went to jail for just pot in this country? Oh my God, it's a huge issue. Yes, there's t- there's lots of people in jail right now because of marijuana charges. But that's is it not not even for a lot of marijuana, right? I think. I think it's like if it's your third strike and it's marijuana, you can actually go to jail for marijuana. But you wouldn't go to jail if your first charge was. A I believe small so, amount of marijuana. and I think that's what people are screaming about. Now, listen, I might be wrong, but I believe there are people in jail because of marijuana charges. Oh, there definitely are. But, but I'm no, just no, saying- but like not, not like third strike. Right. I think legit, maybe what she did. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, re- I really Damon think is writing right. tons of cases with tiny amounts of weed. With massive sentences, it's horrible. Oh, thanks for the uh, editorializing. And then he wrote, it's horrible at the end. Thanks, yeah. Chris Denman. We were curious about your emotions about the news story. <laughs> he wrote, you are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> more editorializing and more stating the obvious, more stating something that uh, yeah. is is already said in this, yeah. already implicit in this podcast. No, I think one of the things that's happened now is they're trying to get people out on appeal that were in jail on marijuana charges because now it's legal. Then the question is, should the charges stand if the crime is no longer a crime? Or leave her there and then send all these American prisoners to Russia. Have Russia just feed them. Three hots and a cot over there. Right. We Russia just take likes, our prisoners. Russia throw likes va- the potheads in uh, prison. We just take a vape pen, throw it in a suitcase, give it to one of our prisoners, and uh, lay them off on the Russian system. Can you yep. imagine life in a Russian prison? I sure can because I watch Stranger Things. Yeah, they went to Russia, huh? They did. He was Spoiler. in a Russian prison. He lost, he lost like 50 pounds for the role, the actor. Also, here's references. Here's what happens. If if we, if we have any listeners who are uh, younger than uh, 45, you have all these references that are at your disposal all the time. And a lot come from school and college, literary references. And boy, do they start fading. So obviously a day in the life of Igor, what's the last name? It ends in Vich. Ivan Dolovich, but... That's literally a book about Russian prison. Right. Iliad, Ilya, ah, oh, good Lord. Ilian Gonzalez? Up. No. According to the ACLU's original analysis, marijuana right. arrests now account for over half of all drug arrests in the United States. Um, of the 8.2 million marijuana arrests between 2001 and 2010, 88% were for simply having marijuana which I guess means a small amount. Um, There's significant racial bias. Despite roughly equal usage rates, blacks are 3.7 times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana. Interesting. A day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Hmm. Solzhenitsyn was the uh, author. Anyway, used to know all that shit. But anyway... I think that Russian prison was, I think, a little different than the one she's going to. I believe so. Uh, Let's do the Alex Jones story. 
Yes, love this. So this was yesterday. Oh, my God. Did you see the video of this? Yes, fantastic. It's... I. I sm- I don't know though. There's something going on with it that rubs me the wrong way. Okay. Alex Jones learns on the witness stand that lawyers, his lawyers, sent his text messages to the rival attorney. While being cross-examined at his defamation trial in Austin, Texas on Wednesday, Alex Jones was informed that his attorneys accidentally sent two years of text messages from his cell phone to a lawyer for the Sandy Hook parents suing him, and then failed to note that the messages were protected under attorney-client privilege. The Sandy Hook lawyer explained, quote, 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message that you've sent for the past two years, and when informed, did not take any steps to identify it as privileged or protected. So then the the lawyer... You realize you just said the story three times in a row in slightly different wording. Well, I wanted some of those keywords in there because I think something fishy is going on. Okay. So so then the lawyer goes, quote, you know what perjury is, right? And Jones goes, quote, yes, I do. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. <laughs> is, is the truth tech? And first of all, you've got one of the biggest podcasts in the fucking world. Yes, you are a tech guy. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, the jury so, and, and it so the, and they sh- so they showed his. They well, sh- what the so what ha- had happened was, um, and I didn't put this in there, but he had a couple of days earlier said, "Do you have?" And I think he asked this before. Like, he did not know the answer. And he asked, do you have any texts, any correspondence regarding Sandy Hook? Did you ever write a text? And do you have any in your phone? And he says, no. Yeah. And so they're claiming they got him on perjury here um, because he does have them. Now, there's a million ways to wiggle out of perjury. Like, he didn't remember them or, like, you know, it actually looks good that he supplied all his text messages. If he knew they were in there, wouldn't he have erased it, number one? And wouldn't he uh, not give up, give them up? But I think what's going on, I'm, and I doubt this is true, but I am wondering if his own attorney has set him up. Because oh. it's, it's yeah. so egregious well, there's and also is, two steps to it, which you mentioned in your three readings of the story, is that <laughs> he, uh, he he gave over the text messages, and then there was a moment, there was a there was an opportunity for the lawyer to say that these are covered under ter- attorney pri- uh, client privilege, which, which he I only did said, not. which I only said once. Yes, go ahead. Right, right, right. Well, I've said it twice now, so I guess that's four times. Um, yes, and then he goes, "Your attorney messed up." All right. First of all, I didn't like that phrasing at all because and sure enough, his attorney uh, filed for a mistrial because of the mess up. So his own attorney filed for mistrial based on his own attorney's mistake? I believe so. Okay. I I do know, but I think the mistrial was rejected. But it's almost like I'm sure the uh, attorneys can't talk because they could be questioned about it. But it's like almost maybe it's even saying that he messed up excuses him. Um, But why would you, especially given the chance, as you said, to make it inadmissible like you were given you messed up twice? I just can't wait for the jury to actually see. Can you imagine the text that Alex Jones sends this alcoholic, hateful, racist lunatic? I mean, it's going to be somebody should release it as a book. I mean, is it part of the public record now that it's been released in a trial? I mean, imagine seeing a dead child emoji with a dollar sign after it. I think there are probably famous cases, and I bet some listeners know, where the attorney, the defense attorney about uh, defending someone incredibly egregious. Now, of course, they are sworn. They have to defend them to their best of their ability. But in like a case like this where, I mean— if if you're not if you're anything being a lawyer, it's 
about the truth. And I know I'm being a little naive here, but it really is. At least in an ideal world, that's what it's about. And when all of a sudden, and that's what the whole judicial system is set up to do, which is just like with the voter election fraud, like, is there fraud? A lot of people are saying that, like, can we come to a truth as, as an objective a truth as we can possibly get to? And I think that's what all this is about. So in this case, he's one of the diseases in this world who is just like to claim that that did that's Stalin-esque and it's a racing of something that really happened. You know what I mean? Right. And like to deny that that's like denying the Holocaust, like where there's ridiculous evidence, ridiculous well, amounts. Right. Of and this is where, um, you know, the, the, the system works because in theory, this will bankrupt him and put him out of business so he can no longer put out untruths like this that have an effect on society. And um, what was the what was the company that put out Hulk Hogan's sex tape and they got uh, they got oh. sued out of existence? Uh, gossip. Gawker? Uh, Gawker. Yeah. Gawker. Yeah. Like they were a shit company and we're glad they're gone and the system worked. No, that's a very different story, actually. Is it? With Teal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funding it. Teal didn't like. This is what happened. And I'll probably. Thiel or Teal? The Peter guy we Teal. met. Yeah. So Peter, we'll call him Teal. Peter Thiel. Teal. Thiel? He is a billionaire. I, I believe. PayPal. I, I believe what I'm saying is true. So I think Gawker outed him. So he set out to destroy Gawker. He saw an opportunity in this case with Hulk Hogan, and he completely bankrolled the lawsuit to bring down Gawker. Right. No, I understand that. But my point is Gawker should not be in existence. I mean, a company that takes sex tapes and puts them out for profit, I think there's no place for that in society. I don't know if you can... Unless it's the Kardashians, in which case, big place. Uh, it's very complicated putting out a sex You can't just put out a sex tape. Uh, I don't believe at all. No. Espe I mean, especially if the person had no knowledge of being recorded or if they did have a knowledge and then a, you know, a reasonable expectation that it would be private, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this Alex Jones thing is amazing. And it did make me think, imagine if you just heard all of a sudden someone has two years of all your text messages. Oh, my God. Oh, like, That's my first reaction. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I text and that's stuff us. now. I have gotten to the point now, like somebody sent me a text. You know, we have a text chain going with somebody who's a good friend of ours who wrote something to me yesterday that I realized, if taken out of context, would look really bad on my phone. And I erased that part of the message. And it wasn't. It was not actually proof of any guilt on anybody's part. It just looked bad. And so I took it out. I'm looking at my cell phone and emails as public record because who knows? We are, All right. So you, you've seen like recently like Google exec was being questioned. All so it's like, so do you have access to everybody's text messages and everything? And he's like, he tried to wiggle out of it. And he's like, well, I mean. The technology, if their phone is backing up and like, in other words, it's on servers and it's like, can you, if you wanted and do you have the right to access all text messages? And he was forced to say yes. Yeah. And so in a way, I'm glad we're in comedy. I think we actually have an out. It's like, well, what do you want? This guy's a jokester, you know? Yeah, right. Um, And so, but boy, it. It still wouldn't get us out of jail. Uh, and context is everything. But that's the funniest thing is we're actually, like, I like to think good guys in terms of, like, I don't think we're hateful and uh, and bigoted. And I don't know of you hating anybody except maybe Erin right now for her snoring. And so anyway, I mean, and we're still, like, not a chance. Not a chance are you going to look at my text from two years. Well, I I think that sometimes I do things for shock value and that those if those things exist, 
there is no way I can explain that a guy I went to college with that I would call a woman a cunt. Oh my God! I just revealed what my what my text was. That uh, that I would talk about. I'm just kidding. I didn't call anybody a cunt. Um, but well, the main thing for me is I'd have to somehow. So why are all your dick pics uh, black? <laughs> Seems weird. <laughs> right. Right. And how come you're only capturing the middle section of the penis? Um, um, all right. All let's right. let's move on. Oh, by the way, speaking of that word, I could tell uh, Sophie had hung out with a lot of Brits and Irish girls because. I go, when asking about Paris, she was like, uh, it's good. But she's like, the people, that, they're all cunts. They're all cunts, <laughs> the Parisians. <laughs> I was so proud. That's great. Yeah. A Mississippi man, speaking of uh, things, a Mississippi man said his pet <laughs> cat helped prevent a robbery at his home, and he credits the calico with possibly saving his life. Bandit, mm. a 20-pound cat, lives with her retired owner, Fred Everett, in the Tupelo suburb of Belden. When at least two people tried to break into their shared home last week, the cat did everything she could to alert Everett of the danger. The attempted robbery occurred at 3 a.m. Everett said he was first awoken by meows in the kitchen. Then she raced into the bedroom, jumped onto the bed, and began pulling the comforter off of him and clawing at his arms. Everett knew something was wrong. Yeah, your cat wanted to have sex with you. <laughs> She had never done that before. What in the world is wrong with you, I said. He got up to investigate, saw two young men outside his back door. One had a handgun. The other was using a crowbar to try to pry open his door. Everett said by the time he retrieved a handgun and returned to the kitchen, the would-be intruders had already fled. Everett told the newspaper he did not call the police. Wait, hold on. Hold on, lefty. He's got a cat. <laughs> I've got allergies. Let's, let's get out of here. Lefty. <laughs> These are old-timey burglars? Yeah, they had on the little scully caps. Okay, here's the detail that jumped out to me. A 20-pound cat? Right. It probably thought it was food delivery and was so excited <laughs> and trying to get him out of bed to open the door. Right. Also, how did it even jump? How did it make the jump up to the bed? Right. Does he have a futon on the floor? <laughs> yeah, and they probably thought it was a lion, the robbers. They were like, this motherfucker, he's one of those guys that keeps lions in the house. I saw it on Netflix. I have a feeling this cat keeps out all the potential uh, ladies also coming over uh, <laughs> without doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, a 9-11 call made by air traffic controllers suggested co that a co-pilot who died after he exited a plane during a mid-flight emergency last week may have jumped, a recording released Tuesday showed. The body of Charles Crooks, 23, was recovered last weekend after he plunged from the plane near Raleigh, North Carolina. He did not have a parachute when he exited the twin-engine Casa CN-212 Avio car, sparking questions about whether he had fallen or jumped. Uh, huh. Maybe the other pilot was talking about how charming only murders in the building is. I would have fucking jumped, too. <laughs> I think I once said... I told Zach, I go, uh, I just saw a uh, due date. Was that his movie, right? Driving across country? Yeah. I just saw a due date and I tried to walk out. Un unfortunately, I'm on a plane, <laughs> <laughs> which is an old joke. Uh, but I, I turned, I twisted it around a yeah. little bit. But um, I tried to walk out, but I was asleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what, what is, there's something wrong here. Also, uh, wait. Maybe he didn't want to pitch in for gas. He's 23 years old and he's a co-pilot? I the, know. That does seem young. Maybe it was going down because this guy from the previous story brought his 20-pound cat on board. <laughs> yeah, right. And they just uh, <laughs> guesstimated for what a yeah. typical cat weighs. Uh, maybe he was sick of having to read the the offer for the, uh, for the free credit card over the intercom. The, the amount plane. of interruptions. Also, what is it about... Like, I think about airplane psychology a lot. Like, I, I actually have, I thought for a long time, the, uh, the, the bad food on planes, like the legendarily bad food on planes when they used to serve food, I thought was intentional because it's kind of like, look over here, look over here. Don't think about you are in a chair 
30,000 feet above the earth. Yeah. Uh, so, and I know I'm wrong there, but I think that is a big part of it. So the um, when the pilot comes on to tell you what how he's doing it, what route he's, we don't, everyone's already trying to watch their show. Right. And it freezes it entirely. It, also, how about not freezing it for some announcements? So if you want to listen, you just, you pause, you take yeah. out your earphones. Right, right. Yeah, except for the initial announcement. That's, I, I mean, it is amazing to me the volume level as well that they have it on. They don't realize they put the phone right up to their mouth and scream, and it's fucking jarring. I've covered the speaker above my head with a pillow before, like, you know, or yeah. a blanket or whatever I had. Uh, it's especially if the speaker's right over your head, it's ridiculous. But why did this guy jump? Um, hey, I don't he, know. Because at, at best, you're only matching what's going to happen, you know, to the plane if you don't survive. But every pilot knows you have a fighting chance. Even if both engines die, there's 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 miracles that can happen with landing a plane. Well, maybe the guy farted. <laughs> I think you're overthinking it. You could find a lay. I wonder what the things are. I mean, he's 23. I bet he was wondering, too. But aren't there like techniques where you come in on trees or obviously I don't know if water is much better, but big planes have dipped a, uh, a wing in the ocean i've seen that technique really yeah 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 i wow. bet there are i bet there are a lot of techniques of no power and and i do know that the interstates are built uh every five miles i believe every five miles there's a one mile straight stretch huh. by by design it's also the reason why they have golf courses it's one of the arguments with people that people that are proponents of not of not getting rid of golf courses because there's such an environmental waste say it's because it's a place for planes to emergency land. Meaning so white guys who can afford to pl airplanes as their hobby can land on white fields of golf courses. Got and, and that's why I always bring your clubs when you fly. Always bring them. <laughs> If they some clubs, if they find out it's a Jewish pilot, they do not run out with fire extinguishers. <laughs> Mind if we play through? <laughs> um, pregnant. Oh wait, we can do this. Yeah, pregnant Georgians can now ready for this. Can now list their fetuses as dependents on their tax returns. The Georgia Department of Revenue released new guidance this week, establishing that the agency will quote recognize any unborn child with a detectable human heartbeat as eligible for the Georgia Individual Income Tax Dependent Exemption. Georgian taxpayers can claim an exemption in the amount of $3,000 for each dependent. Well, all right, good. I'm claiming each of my sperm as a, as, as a dependent. That's $3,000 times 100 million sperm. That's $300 billion write-off. Wow. Unless I jerk off before April 15th, then it's like 50 bucks. Yeah, it doesn't replenish at the rate we used to. No. Not at all. Uh, okay, I'm doubting that an unborn Ge Georgian is worth $3,000. <laughs> I'm just going to come out and say it. <laughs> How much is a born Georgian worth? Even less, <laughs> but you have to add a little more for the potential. <laughs> Remember those stories that, like, that unborn became Beethoven. Yeah, right. So, um, but, uh, that, that's crazy. Um, also I think in Georgia, if you have sex while pregnant now, it is technically a threesome. Right. If she wonders why you keep high-fiving her, it's like, because I'm having my first three-way. Yeah, exactly. Um, the more I thought about this, it's easy to poke holes in it. I, I think it kind of makes sense. But... I think you, oh, no. I was going to say, maybe you give the money back if you don't have the child. Uh, give the money back if? Like, if it doesn't go to term. Obviously, now, what, abortions, right? Are not, so, but I'm just thinking because the reason you get this credit is because children are expensive. Yeah. Well, so are unborn children. Right. 
So it kind of makes sense. Well, I think if the government's role in society is to legislate change that's good for the greater good, then abortion should be a write-off because we don't don't we not want too many people? Or do we want no, I think we actually want people now. I think the government's trying to encourage more procreation right now, which is weird that we've stopped immigration and we're stopping uh so I guess we're we're creating we're getting rid of abortion because we also got rid of immigration and we need somebody to replace the immigrants to do the work. I think, you know, many, many cultures recognized and definitely Native Americans that the this is a failed like there is a an expiration date on this planet. And so uh, Native Americans famously tried to live in a, you know, so things were circular, reusing and that it was circular and not linear. And so um, and I think then all of a sudden, then the smartest people in the world, many of them became fascinated with space exploration and many of them as a means to solve this problem that's coming down the pike, which is uh, Earth is in, inhabitable uh, or it's just full or what or dead. Mm. So uh, I know really uplifting, but what I mean, this is such a shit show. Like, are we just g- going to keep growing the population? I mean, I, I, by the way, I have no idea what the answer is. Also, stagnating the population, I don't even think works. To, certainly, if it goes down, it doesn't work. There is some number of what every human, the exact number of offspring they need for the, for the world to maintain its population. And that number is higher than you think. Yeah, I remember. So I don't know. I have no answer. I remember reading recently. I don't even have questions, obviously. Go ahead. In the last 50 years, I think the population is like tenfold what it was before. It's crazy. Yeah, Denman, even America. can you look that up? But can you believe not that long ago there was um, North America, which un, untouched by the modern, you know, the modern world at that time. Right. That's crazy. Uh, Denman just literally wrote, sorry, search term question mark. Are you fucking kidding me? What, what would you, you like searched? Population of the Earth in the last 50 years. Wait, are you getting down on Chris for... <laughs> he called you? me sleepy. He goes, would uh, you like sleepy? I am. I'm fucking sleepy. You're not showing it yet. Oh, good. Uh, honestly, though, uh, I don't think you could pay me enough money to listen to this podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, like, I don't know how he does it. Like listening to Did this you just live. Insult all of our listeners. No, no, no. Because <laughs> no, I. I mean, maybe no. I, hats <laughs> off to him. Hats off to him. Uh, the old Very... tip of the cap to you. Yeah. No, but but hanging in there and and let, Chris every week has to do it live, and we're just meandering. Here's the population. He nailed it. Look at that population. All right. So in 1950, no, this goes through 2050. This isn't it. Well, just do 1950 to 2020. All right, so to 2020, it is it is tripled, it is tripled in the last 70 years. So I was close. I said 10 times as much. Right, and the growth rate was nine in 1950. The growth rate was 19 percent. It is currently it peaked 8.7 percent, and it's gone down every year. It peaked at 22 percent in 1960. Yeah, and it's gone down every year since 1960, and now it's only 8.7 percent growth rate. Wow! So you'd think some huh. housing would be a little more affordable, All right? Um, we're gonna run out. I think we're gonna run out of housing. Uh, entertainment. What makes you think we're running out of housing? All the people living <laughs> on the streets surrounding your house. I think I saw a guy yesterday. He had a tent on Venice Boulevard. He has a tent that has a grill out front. It's got a door that has a frame on it with hinges and a welcome mat. Kick Uh, off your shoes before you come outside. 
here's how useless the city can be. Uh, I was reading something. Uh, actually, Dickie sent it to me uh, from Rosie's Bagels. Get them. Delicious. And although not a great, not great context to be talking about delicious bagels. So he sent me this article about homeless and that there used to be there's a law about oversized vehicles being parked. You know, they're trying to, you know, the idea over is 50 you, feet. Yeah. The idea is you, you don't have your RV sitting there. And uh, and these have been sitting there for years, literally years and that they have grills like you're describing. Most. But one concern they brought up was because they thought this will get the city's attention was what about all the sewage and uh, that they they felt that they the sewage from them was being dumped down the city drains, which is totally illegal. And so they immediately rushed out to check it and they did find fiberglass tubing that was in the uh, drain, the sewer in the street, but it wasn't connected to the RV. So can't do anything there. And they left. Huh. <laughs> Really? Like, how useless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about a DNA test? I, I think there's a bazillion ways to prove that when you're not looking, that that tube is connected. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Uh, I did not watch anything this week because, as I said, I was on vacation with my lovely bride. We had a nice time, and all we did was read. We sat on the dock. Got a book recommendation, a summer read for you guys. It's called A Gentleman in Moscow. It's by a guy named Amor Towles, who is, uh, he's written a bunch. I should have written down the names of the other books he wrote, but you'd recognize them. Um, hmm. So fucking good. Such an amazing read. It's uh, long. It's like 600 pages, but it's worth it. I got to get, I'm going to write, you know. This is how scattered I am. I know you're really tired today, but I took an Adderall and a coffee at the top of this podcast. I'm still working nice. on the coffee. Carry no, because me, baby. This is, maybe you can relate to this. This is how I know when I'm especially scattered. I can't keep track of my to-do lists. Like, there's six of them. Yeah. I don't know where they are. I don't know which ones. Uh, I, I can't remember where I wrote the thing I have to do, which one it's on. So here I am. This is probably my third one in two days, fourth one that I'm starting. But I want to put, what was the book you did a book club on? And I keep meaning to download it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ant Kind. Ant Kind, right. I've just heard too many amazing things about it. Now now I trust you. Um, so I got to get Ant Kind and read. All right. I did no reading, uh, but I did watch. Last night, Sophie was home. She was jet lagged. So she wanted to watch something. So we went on Netflix and we said, all right, we're either going to watch The Gray Man, which is um, on Netflix, the new movie, or Hustle, which is Adam Sandler's movie on Netflix. Let me guess, the, she convinced you to watch Adam Sandler. No, I looked up the Metacritic ratings and I guess the uh, Gosling movie, The Gray Man, was below 50%. So we watched Hustle, which I've heard is really good from a lot of people. Listen, it's not bad. It's super feel good. It feels like an after school special. Uh, but, you know, they say one of those things to do if you're in this business is don't just criticize it. How would you make it better? That is so hard to do, I have to say. And um, but I think they were just looking for more ways to keep the cat up the proverbial tree, as they say, you know, in act two. And they repeated things. Sandler is becoming such a good dramatic actor, by the way. Yeah, I will say that. Yeah. But uh, it really reminds me of Jeff Nichols. But I I just wasn't, like, they ran out of challenges, and they repeated them. What is he, and a basketball coach or something? Scout. He works for the 76ers, and he's a scout. That's where you really see him. He doesn't want to be a scout anymore. That's the, that's the thing that they give you up top, page 20 right. probably, in a script, like, Find our guy, and then you're going to be the assistant coach. And um, right. so he had us to find a guy. He finds a guy. This is all up top. And anyway, uh, not worth it. If you're looking for things to watch, yeah, okay. not watch. A lot of NBA people, I guess, that that pleases a lot of, uh, it, you know, I didn't even know who half of them were, obviously. So, uh, But Dr. J's in it. I loved seeing Dr. J. Did we talk about the um, WeWorks uh, 
do, docu, not docu series, the series with. Uh, I, uh, I started to watch it. We Jared never talked Leto. about it. I started to watch it on my own, but we never talked about it. We watched. Uh, we haven't seen the last episode, but it's it's so bad, it's good. His accent is so bad. I and like there, him. And his, his character, and I forget the woman's name who's in it with him. She's a big deal. Uh, yeah, actress. no, of course. Yeah. What's her name? Uh, from um, Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's it it's you can't stop watching. It's like a bad read. You have to keep going. Um, and I I would recommend it. Yeah, and Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. By the yeah. way, she's done some outstanding nudity in her day. Oh really? Yes. In this has. movie? Not in this movie, but she has in other ones. Huh. Not in The Devil Wears Prada. Nope. Did she do one The Devil Wears Nothing? The Devil Wears a couple hands on her titty bombs. That's what that one was. It was she was with somebody famous. I can't remember the nude scene, but she was she was with, you could tell it was like, all right, she's not going to do nu- she's not going to do nudity for Pauly Shore, but she is for fucking, you know, uh Chris Hemsworth. Of course. Well, it's also the level. Of, is it art? Duh. Uh, did you finish the bear? Yes. I don't know if I can. I mean, everyone says it gets better. Uh, it gets better and better and better. It, and, and it really leaves you off going like, cannot wait for season two. Really? It is such a great setup for a second season. It the whole, It's almost like a pilot it turns out the season is like a pilot episode for what season two is going to be. What does another brother have a muffler shot Don't that worry he has about to save? It. All right. You worry too much. No, that show worries too much. I'm watching them all freak out about using the right French phrases when they're serving fucking hot dogs. <laughs> it's such a, oh my God. I know, but it'll all make sense. Trust me. It would It'll be like Apollo sense. 13, like the best scientist, like worrying about all like a backyard balloon launch on a fucking like water rocket. It's so stupid. Yeah. Uh, the nude scene she did was with uh, Gyllenhaal. Is it Gyllenhaal or Gyllenhaal? Gyllenhaal. Jake. Is it Gake or is it Jake? Come on. Nice alliteration there. Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal uh, gave it to her pretty good in a movie. I'll tell you that much. But you couldn't tell me what movie. No, maybe That's you fine. know that would be a great thing if Denman actually put that information as well. Or should I should I beg for each scrap of information as we go along? And when he listens, he gets shit from you. I I, I, I can't even put a dollar number on what would how I could pay attention to this podcast. Love and other drugs. It's called. Thank you, Chris. Go back to sleep. I've now. never even heard of that. Make America Florida. Let's do it. All right, a Florida man has been arrested for attempting to break into the Patrick Space Force Base using a stolen truck. And why did he do it? To warn the U.S. government of a war between aliens and Chinese dragons. His there's arrest a war after the, between. Wait, there's a war between aliens and Chinese dragons? Why is this not in front page? No, and they've never gotten along. It's very racist. Anyway, yeah. his arrest affidavit noted that he stole a 2013 Ford F-150 three days before driving to the Patrick's uh, Air Force Base, sorry, Space Force Base, located in Brevard County. According to his arrest affidavit, Johnson said he was ordered by President Biden in his head to steal the truck and drive it to the Space Force Base to, quote, warn the government about U.S. aliens fighting with Chinese dragons. Wait, why Why didn't Biden call the Space Force Base, the Patrick Space Force Base, directly? Why did, they, why did he call this guy to go there in a truck? I think this guy is very special. Uh-huh. And it makes sense that they called him. And also... He's trying to put the pieces together, and he's like, this is why Pelosi's in Taiwan this week. Uh, yes. Because yes. the Chinese dragons. Yeah, yeah. Um, in reading that, it's interesting that even the paper said it was because he was ordered by President Biden in his head. Was it in President Biden's head? And did he, like, telepathically 
see, or I'm assuming they meant it's in his head, he heard and saw President Biden deliver this message. I think it was in Biden's head and it was in this guy's eyebrow. Usually it's an it's a head to eyebrow communication. Do you remember Attell? This is just we talk about Attell so much, which which he deserves. But he had a thing about being crazy or something in a bank and like talking to to someone in your eyebrow. And I just remember <laughs> it can be the details. Do you remember the name of the person in the eyebrow? No. It was Terry. He's like, what, Terry? <laughs> right, right. And he's making this face and looking up at his eyebrows. He's like, what was that, Terry? <laughs> Shoot them all? Like, it, it was so hysterical. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um. So anyway, that's Florida. He stole a good truck, man. What a waste of a successful heist of an of a F-150. Uh, yeah, I know, but. Three days before, he got away with it. Yep. And then he has to take a different car to go fight the aliens or warn them to fight the aliens and the dragons. I know. Not not going somewhere, not going to a scrapyard was just crazy. What he did was crazy. You could also walk up. I mean, you did sit on the truck for three days before going to the base. You could have That's walked true. up to the base and delivered this message. Maybe you usually- jotted down a little note. And in your typical Spielberg movie, you do approach on foot. There's like a, you know, there's a big shot. There's a wide shot with somebody approaching a large base in a small driveway. And they're, you know, do it right. Yeah, or it's at night with flashlights. Yeah. Like E.T. Now, what what do you think U.S. aliens are? U.S. aliens. Uh, Mexicans. Exactly. Thank you. Let's move on. Sports. All right. Uh, the female Tour de France. Uh, what? So <laughs> you can't even call it inaugural and you can't call it the first because technically it's not. There have been efforts to have women have their own race there as well. Anyway, the female Tour de France, France fell into chaos on Thursday as a mega pileup swallowed dozens of riders just 45 kilometers from the finish line. Several of the riders sustained injuries and one was rushed to the hospital. <laughs> All right, it was the fifth stage of the, this article is calling it the first female Tour de France. Oh. So it, did, it did have a different name back then. This stage has been, uh, has, was seen as a sprint before the challenging stage, which is next in the mountains. Um, anyway, there's details about the crash. And then logistically, uh, a little context here. Logistically, the men's race is 13 days longer. Uh, the women's race is, uh, the men's race is 21 days versus eight days for the women. And the cycling distances of this, each stage are also on average 50 to 100 kilometers shorter for the women. Um, Bore de France, more like it. Tour de Farce. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why is it, and this is, why is it that they make it shorter for women? Because the truth is, I have heard that women are actually built better for long distances than men are. Yes, and- they're also built, they're built way better for long stories and long chats. But men are better for long ex- excuses. <laughs> no, they are. The famous, uh, whatever they're called, super distance runners. That's yeah. not it. Oh, women, no men, no man. I, it's kind of like saying no woman will ever lift as much as a man. No man, I think, will run uh, that that race, whatever that distance is. Uh, it's over 100 miles, I think, uh, faster than a woman. I don't think. I think that if you took a man and a woman and you had them start running next to each other, eventually he would just scream, you win, and stop. Does that mean she won the race? (laughs) Or he'll just start drinking in his basement. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Um, yeah, Here you go. Scientists say women could dominate ultra ultra marathons women have have greater muscle endurance than men a study appears to show Researchers a physical from, difference 
Researchers from the University of British Columbia found women were less tired after natural muscle exercises than men of a similar age and athletic ability. So why is it that in, uh, in, in tennis tournaments, men play five sets and women play three? And not only that, they are exhausted at the end of three very often when you see them. Like, I mean, Serena, I think, was out of shape. But, you know, you see them at the end of their third set, and they are white. Right. Um, I think you have to get past a certain certain level of endurance. Like, it has to be a really—they tap into fat resources, I believe is what that's saying. Um, and that, I think, you have to be completely depleted. I don't right. know what I'm talking about, but that's my guess. All right. Well, this is my guess. That it's time to go to this day in history. All right. Do you notice how we didn't even talk about the, the stereotype of women driving? We did not go for the low-hanging fruit on that story. Nope. We did not. But I just you want to go back? In. I just snuck it in, kind of. I just snuck it in <laughs> saying, those are the jokes we didn't do about their inability to drive. Wait, one quick story. Did I ever tell you, it doesn't even matter, and this is in anti-Liz. I guess it is a little bit. When I was married to Liz, um, we got into watching The Amazing Race at one point, and uh, like everybody, like it was the number one show in the country, and, uh, and this was like in the early 2000s or something. And she's like, uh, we were laying in bed while she said, you know, I bet we do really well at that. And I spit up whatever food I had in my mouth. Uh -huh. And there was no getting out of that. And we basically had to go into <laughs> and I eventually had to be honest. And I'm like, all right, let me how about this? Let me just ask you a couple of questions. How long can you look at a map in a car? And she's like, less than a minute. <laughs> I'm like, do I need to say all the other things like 40 bazillion pee breaks <laughs> or or allergies from dust. I go, do you see like where some of the terrain they're running through and stuff? Yeah. And how about all our fights in airports? You can't even <laughs> handle getting to the airport less than two hours early. Yeah. No, by definition, we will never be let, let like more than five minutes early to an airport. Yeah. Like yeah. there were a million things I could have brought up. That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, in 2005, August 7th, there was a, tra a, a trapped Russian sub was rescued. Uh, it was a mini submarine with seven crew members on board. It was in the South Pacific, and they'd been part of some training exercises off of Russia's far eastern peninsula when the propellers became entangled in cables that were part of Russia's coastal monitoring system. Unable to surface, the sub's crew was stranded in the dark, freezing submarine for more than three days. I mean, you talk about this guy jumping out of the plane. I would have popped that fucking latch and said, just kill me now. Three freezing, dark days with a bunch of Russians. Where's the documentary on this? Yeah, I know. These are like the, uh, the soccer kids. So they were trapped 190 meters below the ocean surface. Jesus. Okay. Uh, they organized a rescue mission. They helped. They asked us for No, they asked the United Kingdom and the U.S. and Japan for help. And in the ensuing days, the three countries mobilized res rescue crews for the trip to eastern Russia. Uh, the Russian Navy attempted the first lift to, to, to first lift the sub from the water and later to drag it to shallower water where it could be reached by divers. Both approaches were complicated by the 60-ton anchor attached to the cables that had ensnared the sub. Finally, with fears mounting that the trapped crew's oxygen supply would soon run out, the six-man crew of a British-owned and operated Scorpio 45, the Brits once again, just like that Thai soccer team, yep. rescue sub arrived and was able to cut the sub loose. All seven on board, which included six Russian Navy seamen and one representative of the company that made the sub survive the ordeal. So um, this was five years after a Russian nuclear submarine sank, killing 118 people on board. Wow. In that disaster, the Russian government had delayed asking for outside help for some 30 hours, which was blamed for the sailor's death. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if they have evidence of the 118 people on board because it was 
probably very similar protocol to this. Like, I mean, are there efforts to slow down breathing? I'm not even joking. Like, are there efforts to lower everybody? I mean, the, you know, consuming the oxygen. I don't even know what you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, you would think that there would be an external pump that you could pump new oxygen into a sub in a situation like this. Is there any way to convert water? The answer is yes, into oxygen. But Hmm. could a sub do that? Or is there just one smart scientist who's just trying to outlast the other 117? (laughs) And then he's going to, in like whatever that little, uh, you know, the missile silo, he's just going to ingest a little water. Then he takes it. He boils it. then, Then he's creating... The big rescue happens, one genius is left and 117 dead. And then he gets the film rights because he's the only guy that can tell the story. Yeah, exactly. And he feasts on 117 fresh bodies. Oh, that Russian flesh. He he even shuts off the SOS signal. He knows he has months now. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you can suck the oxygen out of their lungs because there's always a little left. And all that sex. (laughs) <laughs> and they, there was even more semen in the sub when they finally rescued the guy all right let's do some letters to the editor okay uh this is from keith uh he says uh keith mcgee here brooklyn born and raised still resides uh i have had to drive a lot for work lately i've been binging you guys are great i feel like i'm hanging out with friends just oh, shooting the shit you are I a do- friend keith I do want to point out something that you uh, may not, not be anymore. after this. Fuck Keith. You spoke too early. I want to point something out. If the deafening silence from Mike whenever Joe Rogan's name is mentioned, it's incredibly obvious that Mike has something to say about Joe, but it's as if he's biting his tongue because Joe is an old friend of Greg. Just an observation. Take it ish, Keith. No. I can honestly say right now I'm a fan of Joe Rogan. I mean, I just like anybody, I'm I'm – don't agree with everything he says and I don't agree with everything he is, but, uh, I think he has a good heart and, and he called me funny and man, that's all it takes. When did he call you funny? I think he, well, you told me he did. Maybe you lied. No, but remember we did a uh, Mary Lynn Rice Cubs like benefit for her school or whatever. And it was in the comedy store and he was one of the performers. And so was I. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. And I, and I happened to do well, you know, I had, funny stuff for parents of young kids in a privileged school. And I kind of criticized them all in a funny way. And so anyway, he liked that. But besides that, um, he's incredibly, no, there's a million things I can list uh, telling you why I like him. Uh, Do I agree with what he said on masks or, and to tell you the truth, I don't even know the full thing, but um, I like Joe a lot. All right. Good to hear. And Joe will be happy to hear. He listens to Every episode. And he makes it this far. Andrew Coco says, uh, on the someone on the seven seventeen episode, someone from the Tilson Institute of Transcendental Studies wrote in about a cover song. While their suggestion was about a cover song was objectively bad, their ability to slip in a tit joke was phenomenal. Check out the acronym of that institute again. T I T. Tit studies. Okay. Ah. They did it. They got us. You Boy, got us. Man, imagine listening that close. I, I, as I've said, I can't even listen to any of this. And imagine listening that closely. Well, this next letter comes from the Central University for Nuclear Technology. Wait a minute. What? J.J. White writes this next one. Oh, this is too long. Why? It's pretty. Why don't you read it? I've never. All right. J.J. White, if that's your real name. Hi, Greg. Okay, because it appears that you and Mike Gibbons received a fair amount of, parentheses, hopefully good spirited, ball busting for not being able to remember. Oh, oh, he's telling us how to Google quickly. Because we couldn't remember uh, names and then we're both stumped, like with Robert Duvall. Uh, yeah. 
All right. Yeah. And if we do that, and if we do that, everybody wins. As always, thanks for your podcast. I do enjoy it on YouTube. All, All right. right. Good. Way to cut out the middle. That was thanks, JJ well done. White. Kevin Craven says a couple weeks ago you mentioned doppelganger bands. I mentioned this. The outpour from people was scant. Uh, bands, and I think of the cars and Cheap Trick, maybe in this vein. I think of maybe um, Aerosmith and I'm listening. Black Crows, maybe in the same what? vein. What? No, no, Jesus, not even. No, that's close. a bad one. That's a bad one. Fog Hat. Yeah. So no. uh, we here's one that I can think of. Uh, here's a few. Vanessa Carlton and Michelle Branch. Never heard of either one of them. The Hives and the Vines. Well, they're an acronyms, practically. Hmm? There's Arctic Monkeys and Arcade Fire, which I said, but then somebody yelled at me. I got an email of somebody yelling that the bands are not similar, but that's because people think they're right. Yeah, Arcade Fire is good. They're it's way better. Good. Chris is yeah, proving he's better. still listening. He's writing that in now. But, yes. Uh, no, I really like some Arcade Fire. No, there's a lot. There's there's bands that you can see. There's obviously very similar, you know, bands. Like uh, when they come up, all of a sudden there's a, all the A&R guys are trying to, like, you know, sign the same thing. You know, the whole, all of Hollywood, including music, is everybody rushing to where lightning just struck, you know? So out of yes. that, uh, there's going to be doppelgangers in that whole Seattle scene, you know? I just don't know enough about it to nail it. But I remember when, Stone Temple Pilots came out. I thought they were very similar to early Pearl Jam. Yes. And I'm sure there's things like, you know, uh, who wrote Dollar Bill? I'm trying to remember that grunge band. I love that song. Um, anyway, yeah, there's a lot. And so, yeah. I, All right. I, I should can't we do the obituary them. or should we go right to the comics? Who's the obituary? Vince Scully. And that's all, folks. Well, how about this? Why don't you and I loosely for a second talk about Vince Scully and then also Bill Russell? Okay. Oh, that's right. Did we, we miss Bill Russell? All right. So Vince Scully, if you're not uh, if you're not from Los Angeles, you still know Vince Scully. Because oh, yeah, he's you a do. National broadcaster, but he was also synonymous with the Dodgers. He did the Dodgers. Are you ready for this? Uh, I got to look it up, but I think it was 60 something years he was the announcer for uh, for the Dodgers. I don't have it written down. Six. It, it was like 60 something years he announced the Dodgers games. It was fucking crazy. But yep. the guy was not just poetic, but what kind of made him was that he was a great storyteller, but he also knew when sometimes to let the game do the talking. Oh my there God! Would be yes, amazing Famous moments that for would it. happen. Yeah, there was a there was the um, there was the time. I guess maybe the most famous was he was calling the game when Hank Aaron uh, broke Babe Ruth's home run record, seven hundred fifteen, and here's how it went: fastball, it's line drive into deep center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It's gone. For the next half minute, Scully didn't say a word, taking it in as the Atlanta crowd cheered and roared the milestone. And then Scully said exactly what the home run meant. Quote, what a marvelous moment for baseball. What a marvelous moment for Atlanta and the state of Georgia. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the Deep South for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. And it's a great moment for all of us. Wow. I did not know he said that. Yeah. And how about it? he called that, which was over Bill Buckner's head. He called the famous Mets 1996. Uh, 86. 86 game where it went through, where Mookie Wilson's ball went through uh, Buckner's legs. Right. Which, by the way, the reason why it went through his legs is because his legs were so bad that he wasn't out in the outfield anymore. Buckner was such a great player that they switched him to first base because you need the least mobility to stand at first base. But he wasn't able to. Uh, well, there's a lot of theories on. No, the but there's also a legs, lot. But. I would say most sports writers also say without Buckner, they're not even in that game. Right. 
they don't make it they don't make it that far in the season. Right. Um yeah, no, the poor guy. But I I I rewatched as a lot of people did the Kirk Gibson call. Oh from, yeah, I saw right that. around that time also in the late eighties yeah. and um and I timed it. So I watched it on YouTube. You have to understand that was one of the craziest home runs ever. Kind of like that Ted Williams where it's all of a sudden like you can you can pluck this event from out of the future. You can almost will it as a crowd and everybody was but he was like this wounded guy, Kirk Gibson, who could barely stand up there, couldn't use his legs to swing. Anyway, when he did the impossible, he um he it was a, it was a walk-off home run in the I think it was game 1 of the World Series. Uh I should know all of that. Yeah, but anyway, they and against Zachary Lee. Anyway, when the ball went out, and he's like, you know, that the ball's gone. He did not say a word for 70 seconds. Wow. And then I heard it might have been two minutes during that 86 uh, Mets, you know, the, the Bill Buckner one we were just talking about. So it's really extraordinary. You know, the funny image, though, is. But by so the way, I, just, to, just to say one thing about that, I was when we were at the cabin. When I said we didn't watch any TV, I actually did. The TV was connected to only a few channels. And so one night I put it on for about an hour and I watched a silent movie. And I was so fucking engrossed. There's something about you being drawn into it because the words are not coming at you. It's not telling you how to feel. It's not informing your mind constantly. And you're forced to actually look at what the characters are doing and what the actors are giving you and think about it. And I think it's that same thing with letting you look at the crowd, look at the players, form your own fucking opinions, form your own emotions. Well, Marshall McLuhan uh, labeled it hot and cold media. And a hot media is one, I believe, I might have switched these, but a hot media, I believe, is one that involves you more. And you're more involved with it. They do all studies even on TV and where your eyes go. And when there there are things that are do exactly what you're saying. And jazz was one that was very, it might have been cool mediums actually that aren't putting out a lot of energy that draw you in more. I, I do remember in school I would mix the two up. But he, he made that distinction between things that are pulling you in. I mean like a book where you're creating all the imagery. Yeah. No, I head. find that with stand-up comedians. There's ones that come at you, and they're, I, I'm not saying one is necessarily better than the other, but uh, I prefer when a comedian can take a pause, make an expression. I mean, Spade is kind of great like this, and draw you in and, so, and, 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 and not fucking hammer you. Uh, sometimes I don't respect the comedian as much who's like prancing the stage and jumping right. up and down and screaming. It's like, all right, well, anybody can do that. Yeah. Well, you know, after that, Kirk Gibson, after the 70 seconds, uh, he goes uh, in an, something like in an in an improbable season, the impossible just happened. So my funny thing to do with him is uh, picture him frantically. Tr the reason there's a delay is he's frantically trying to come up with the line. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The great yeah. line, just like I with know. Hank, just like with uh, Hank Aaron, like that. What a line that was. Yeah. But I think he had that one preloaded. He could not have had the Kirk Gibson preloaded. That he even came to the plate was crazy. But anyway, the other thing that needs to be said about him, so many things do, but the last thing uh, I'll say about him is he's one of those legendary guys that does color, the color commentary and play-by-play. -play. So his stories are always like, love fouls that off to left. Anyway, he was in the steakhouse. You know, and he does both of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a handful of those legendary guys. And Rich Eisen, who's an announcer, he posted on his Twitter. Go to his Twitter. He collected a few of the great ones. And one was this unbelievable story. He talked about a guy at, at the plate. Perfectly timed somehow till his at-bat was over. It was It was incredible. Uh, here's one that Chris just posted. Two years ago in spring training... 
and his uh, he and his wife were roping cattle, which is what they do: one on one pitch, sinker, low ball, two, two and one. And they started <laughs> started by a large snake. Madison thought it was a rattlesnake, so he grabbed an axe and hacked the snake to pieces. But there's something more to the story: two one pitch, low ball, three three. And one. <laughs> when his wife Allie and an ex. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Ah, that's hilarious. I should do that on stage one night. I should call a baseball game while doing my act. Or just be like, uh, she's crossing her legs. She's not really into this bit. <laughs> anyway, the what like just just comment on some, you know, couple yeah. in the crowd, maybe. Yeah. That's funny. Uh so the other one was Bill Russell, you know, just amazing. You can look it up. But one of the most interesting things for me was he when he came up, Bob Cousy was the biggest name in basketball. And um and they won like I think three championships together, and then and then Russell went on to win I think five more in a row, eight in a row total I believe. Anyway, the Kuzi at the Kuzi's still alive, but toward when he got much older, like I think even in his eighties, uh, was in an ESPN interview. And he was talking about Bill Russell. Now, another subject that the backstory to this was the racism in Boston. And Bill Russell has a famous quote about how extraordinary the racism was because you had all types, including like the institutional racism by the Harvard professors. Like, you know, that's just entrenched. They don't even think they're liberal and they don't even think, they're you know, down to the real, real hate. And um, he was had a hard time. I mean. They broke into his house, scribbled racial uh, shit on his walls, and took a shit in his bed. Yeah, right. While while he's the star basketball player for the Celtics. Yeah, yeah. And, and countless other things. And um, Kuzi was the captain and beloved. And also, like, the mouthpiece of the, you know, the Celtics. That's who the press went to to get his take on anything. Anyway, Kuzi is being interviewed as an old man. And when talking about Bill Russell— you, the, the sentence was something about his extraordinary physical ability. No one had blocked, but, but, and all of a sudden started crying, broke down sobbing, and basically came around to saying how much more he should have done back then for Bill Russell. Yeah. And it, anyway, there's a book about it. I should have done more. I think there's even another book about it. But if you want to read something, pretty beautiful in terms of just race and sports i think that was it and bill russell just dealt with so much and you know i thought a lot when i was reading bill russell's uh, new york times had a very good obituary a lot of it's in there i thought about um winning time the lakers uh series you know i used to hate kareem abdul jabbar not only because he was a laker and all that i just saw him as very unfriendly and all that stuff but when you now are seeing what those guys went through right I would have been the most resentful motherfucker you could imagine if I was one of those star black athletes at that time. I, I honestly don't know how they performed so well. No, I was just reading about Nat King Cole. And, um, you know, he was the guy who started singing in the 30s and 40s. And, and then when the civil rights movement started in the 50s, he was criticized for playing segregated crowds in the South, um, he was attacked on stage by a guy with a knife at one point because um, somebody had circulated a picture of him with a white woman. And uh, and he basically said, I mean, his whole point was, I'm, I'm accomplishing something just by being in this arena, by playing, by being a famous black musician and playing in certain cities, that's a first. And so he then came around and he said, you know, but you guys are right. I was slow to coming around and it's time for me to not play any place that's segregated, not play any place that won't put me in a hotel or serve me a meal in their town and uh, and all this stuff. So, I mean, it, it really it put it in perspective of like it's, it'd be easy to criticize Nat King Cole at a certain moment in time, but you're not seeing everything that that guy put up with. Yep. And, you know, uh, Sam Cooke, the same thing. And that was touched on in that uh, One Night in Miami or Three three Nights, whatever that recent movie right. was, which imagined the meeting of Muhammad Ali. He was fighting down there and then Sam Cooke. And 
Um, a Malcolm X. Uh, all right, let's cheer it all up with Jim some funnies. Brown. You got it, pal. <laughs> all right, we're going to do a little Beetle Bailey today. Uh, Miss Bixby is standing there in her beautiful yellow hair. She's got a pearl necklace, which I always found to be a little provocative. I think I think that the Mort Walker, Greg and Mort Walker, were sending us a little message with the pearl necklace. And she says, do I have any volunteers? Three dudes put up their hands. And uh, and then she says to Sarge, they're all yours. And he goes, thanks, Miss Buxley. So they thought that she wanted to be gangbanged. That's the said. That's what they're telling us in the comic strip. That she just randomly yes. walks in the barracks and says, "Anybody want to volunteer to pile drive me? Come on, come this on!" This is going to be the this is going to be the biggest don't ask, don't tell ever in the military. <laughs> well, which leads us to our second Beetle Belly comic strip. Sarge is saying to Beetle, "What's on your mind?" And Beetle says, "Thoughts that I'd rather not share with you." And then Sarge grabs him by the neck and says, I know what you're thinking. And Beetle goes, then why did you ask? <laughs> he was thinking about fucking the sergeant. Not killing him? <laughs> I don't get nope. it. No, it's that don't ask, don't really tell. That really vague. It's don't ask, don't tell. All right. It is don't ask. He is saying don't ask me. He, yep. Yeah. Uh, what am I doing? Uh, Charles Adams? Little Charles Adams, okay. not Scott Adams. All right. Look at this one I found. This one, uh, I should have done it sometime over the last year. This is how ahead of his time, I mean, you know, I'm not saying he saw what was coming, but like talk about edgy also for this time. So it's a guy reading a letter, okay? And he's he's in his basement. And he gets a letter, and I'm going to read, and he's reading, and he goes, Dear fellow alumnus, your face was among the missing at our annual reunion last June. Won't you help us to keep tabs on members of the class of 17 by telling us what you are doing now? And he is reading this among his schematics and diagrams of the Capitol building with cases of dynamite all around him Holy shit. planning an attack on the Capitol. <laughs> Look wow. at it. Wow. He's in his basement. He has a, he has a, for those not watching the podcast, a scale, a scale model of the Capitol and uh, all these boxes of dynamite and, and bombs. And, and a little green the, visor, the bomb making hat. The bomb. Ma oh, and he has cases. Look at under the stairs. How many cases of dynamite he has. Uh -huh. And yep. then on the wall, he has drawings of the uh, of all the grounds around the Capitol. Let me see. That's page 15. And it was class of 17. Let me see what year that cartoon was from. Anyway, Charles Adams is the goddamn shit, man. I mean, so edgy. Um, that was from 1939. January 28th, 1939. Which, by the way, there was a lot of anti-government sentiment right then because it was, uh, wait, 39? Was FDR in office yet? When did FDR I, get in um, office? Maybe it was 40. I forget everything. I already told you that. I forget everything, All so right. I don't know. Hoover? I'm illiterate. All right. Uh, finally, let's get to some Blondie. Dagwood's laying in bed wearing his fucking donut pajamas. He's got his back to Blondie. Why? I have no idea. He says, whoa, I just had the wildest dream. And you go, wait a minute. Maybe maybe someone discovered they're a heterosexual. And she says, what was it about? And he jumps up and he goes, a giant 12-foot chili dog was trying to race me to work. And she goes, wow, who won? And he goes, guess. <laughs> That's funny. Here's my dream. Her butt cheeks are peering up over the edge of that blue blanket. Tan, thin sheen of blonde hair. The light, ref the moonlight reflects off of them as her gaping red anus stares me in the eye. And in between her legs, I can see her upside-down head saying, take it, take the shot. That was my dream. Well, wouldn't Freud say he's in a race 
with a more well-endowed man, which is the giant 12-foot oh, dog, yeah. chili dog. And he's trying to race him to work, and work is sex with the wife. Right, right. I think that's what's going on yep. there. Either way, Blondie's not getting laid. Once again. Uh, so FDR was president in 39, and I'm sure... It, you know, it's all right before. Yeah. The war. So there was a lot. There was a lot of anti-socialist uh, uh, rage in the country at that time, and there were there were plots to kill FDR. They went on throughout his throughout his uh, time in office, and I think there was actually one assassination attempt on him. But they were Except waiting. They, they they aimed too high. He was yeah. In they, the chair. they were waiting for him to stand up to take the shot. Yeah. When was the New Deal? Because I know that had a lot of detractors, to put it mildly. The New Deal might have started after World War II. No, no, no. It no, started at 33, the no, He ran on 33 the New Deal. 33 to 39. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 33 to 39. And there was a lot of people that felt like they, you know, the whole, you have to understand, like, there was, the government was not seen as, as an agent for the, the, the working man. You know, people didn't want no. that. They, they, there was a big thing about everyone takes care of themselves. This is America. It's very similar to today. Well, yeah, the role of government and what people think it should do. You know that great newsletter we get from Heather Cox Richardson. The, Heather Richardson. Heather Cox oh, Richardson. Okay, is that what it is? Yeah. History professor at Boston College. Anyway, she always puts it in perspective that the the cyclical nature of that of the government helping and all and then and very often the country sort of grows and does well after that and then there's a pullback to where government's role should be much more narrowly defined and not do and not be as supportive anyway uh um mike you pulled me through it this week i didn't think i could do it and uh we did it we did it Son of a bitch! Yeah, if well, we now, didn't do it. now I'm and now I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna drop off a cliff. I gonna I'm gonna have to um, take Adderall just to socialize tonight. I know I'm gonna have to have uh, my fourth cup of coffee today, or to if I take a nap, I don't think I'll ever come out of it. Hey, an email came in during this podcast on Thursday. Alex Jones ordered to pay four point one million to Sandy Hook parents. And the jury is to decide on additional damages. See, I don't think that's enough to hurt him. I think he makes that in a year easily. Oh, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think just on his sneaker deal, on his sneaker deals and endorsements. Right. right. Reading ads for Mangrate. I'm going to look up what is his net worth. I mean, you think these things are accurate? No, they're not. But they're there. Uh, they say ten million dollars, so four million doesn't hurt him that much. Another place says he's worth five million. Listen, hmm. we know podcasters that used to get fifty thousand dollars a read. Isn't that true? Uh, there are podcasters that get. Uh, I don't know about 50. I know 10. I know a lot. Some people get 10,000 a read, maybe 20. Yeah, yeah, probably 20. I don't know about 50. Well, here, I'll just say it. I thought before Rogan at his height got 50 from some really? sponsors. No, I don't know. I don't know, I, I don't know how I could have made that. that up. It's probably false. That, Any, I mean, anytime you hear stuff about money, it's always wrong. Yeah. So I take it back. I doubt that exists. But, but I yeah. do know. I do know that uh, Tim, 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 uh, what's his name? Tim uh, Dylan. He gets two hundred twenty thousand a month on his Patreon. So that's, you know, that's not nothing. It's three Is million that, a year. Did you just out him? Is that public? Oh, he keeps it public. He wants people to know. Yeah. Oh wow. All right. Glad we're helping him. Maybe he should pay us to do an ad for his podcast. Right. Uh, um, already, fella. Well, I'm glad you made it through it. Yeah, we did it. And uh, we'll see you in God in two hours. Jesus Christ. There's going to be a food truck, right? Yes, there is. All right, good.
Wow. It's two hours. Oh, man. All right. All right. I'll see you then. <laughs> Take Thanks, it Chris. ish, everybody. Thanks for all your hard work. Take it ish. Chris listened again. I don't know how he did it. God bless. Well, I pulled a newspaper from a garbage can. It was from five weeks ago. And I gave it to Mike and Greg to read to you on a Sunday paper show.